you spend any amount of time looking at plants in the tropics, you'll probably start to see a lot of plants growing on other plants. And scientists have a name for this. They're called epiphytes, which means, in Greek, upon plants. Pretty straightforward. Now, I found these, and these are not only epiphytes, but another word I love to say. They're myrmecophytes. Now, if you watched my video on Cecropia trees, or you just have unusual interests, that word may be familiar. It also comes from Greek and basically just means ant plants, which is because, well, they have a mutualistic relationship with ants. But while you will see a lot of parallels to the relationship between Cecropias and ants from that previous video, the nature of the relationship here is a fair bit different. And these, coming from the same root word as myrmecophyte, are myrmecodias. And now there's a number of different species, and a few of them are present just right around this area, but all but one of the species are found on this island of New Guinea, and most of them more so up high in the highlands here. Now these plants have a very distinct appearance. At first glance it may appear that they're being parasitic on this lily poly tree here, but to be parasitic they would have to be harming the tree in some way or taking its resources, but really all it's doing here is using the tree for structural support. It's not really negatively affecting the tree at all. But that puts them in a pretty tricky spot. See, they're up here with their roots just used to cling onto these trees, up in a place where they can get very little water, very little water stays around, and that's why they do tend to cling to trees that have rough bark or absorbent bark, where they do get at least a little bit of water staying there after a rain. But while it can get water that way, at least a little bit, plants tend to get a lot of their nutrients from the soil through their roots, but this one doesn't have its roots in the soil. So how, how does it get those? Well, that's where the ants come in, and that relationship is fairly elaborate here. The most noticeable physical characteristic in this plant is the bulge near the roots, and we'll call this a tuber. It's an enlarged stem, and as the plant is developing, and the stem starts out pretty small, but it'll start to develop these small cork-like structures inside the stem, which over time will kind of dry out and just leave these holes inside these little cavities here that you can see looking at the end. So as you've probably seen already, these holes here, these tunnels, they're great places for the ants to live. And the ants don't actually need to dig any of these out at all because the plant makes them whether there's ants there or not. And this bulging area here, it's also where the plant stores a lot of its water and its nutrients, which is one of the reasons it has these spines here to keep as protection against herbivores. And so these cavities, they're actually also connected by all these little holes you can see. And that not only helps the ants get from one room to another throughout the whole plant, but it also helps the plant a bit with keeping ventilated, because it can get pretty hot in the sun up here. And there is a fair bit of pressure on these plants to have a lot of these cavities, because the more cavities they have, the lighter they are, because there's more air in there. So these, these plants, they're not hanging on by much. You see just these little spindly roots hanging around a branch. And so if you have a really heavy one with not many cavities, that thing's gonna fall off pretty easily. So plants with genes like that, the code for big, thick, heavy tubers, they don't tend to survive very well. But these cavities are actually set up in a pretty interesting way. See, they, they're laid out pretty randomly throughout the thing, but quite evenly spaced. But aside from these ones that kind of form ridges along the outside, which are the main access points for the ants, there's kind of two main types of cavities in here. So the first type are the smooth-walled chambers, and these are just kind of general living spaces for the ants. They live there, they have their nurseries for their larvae there, just kind of plain old rooms. But the more interesting cavities here are the rough-walled ones, and these are where the ants will put their waste, uh, some of their prey leftovers, and also kind of use it as a graveyard for ants that have died from their own colony. And I guess as well you'll also see some just nest material spread throughout, little pieces of bark and leaf and stuff like that. And see, that is actually how these plants are benefiting from the ants being there. Because see, in the rough walled chambers, they've got all these little nubs sticking out on the walls of the chamber, which is what makes them rough walled. And those little nubs are actually nubs of root. And so as these things break down, the dead ants, dead prey, the waste, bacteria break that down, and then these root pieces are able to absorb all the nutrients from that. And scientists have tried to put nutritive substances in both types of chamber, and it seems the smooth-walled ones just don't absorb at all, really. So it seems the ants choose, or perhaps not consciously choose, 
but they do work to put their their resources in the areas where the plant can benefit from it. So to make it even more interesting, it seems the ants sometimes actually choose foods that are specifically more nutritious for the plant. See, amongst the ant graveyards here, scientists noted that there was a disproportionately high number of ant heads compared to other parts of their bodies. And the, the head is by far the most nutritious part of the ant. So did the ants just throw out a bunch of the rest of the parts of the ants, or what happened exactly? Well, we don't actually know. But it's an interesting relationship nonetheless. So what's in it for the ants? Well, this tree may not be the best example of this because it's quite short, but it's a great place for the ants to stay. It gives them a place high up in the canopy to be able to stay and access those high up resources without having to go back to a ground nest every time, risk getting eaten, stuff like that. And the plant itself is great shelter. I mean, it's not very attractive to herbivores. It's a small plant covered in spines. It's got only a few tough leaves and an army of ants that come out biting if you bump into it. So, I don't know, my bet wouldn't be on eating that. Now, because of this, it does make reproduction a little bit tricky, because you can imagine, you put out a flower, not many insects are gonna go for that. If they do, there's an army of attack ants right next door. So typically it just self-pollinates or gets pollinated by the wind. And the seeds too, they have a bit of a clever trick because you can imagine landing on the ground, that's not a good place for these things to grow, at least not most species. So what they'll do is have a fruit that it's embedded in the side of the plant and it'll only emerge when it's ready to be eaten. And a bird will come along, eat it, and then poop the seeds out on another trunk of a tree. Thus, the cycle of life continues. So it's a really interesting life cycle, and there's a lot of competition in nature between different species. But it is interesting when you get to look at those examples of interspecies cooperation as well. But anyways, that's all I have for this week. As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or interesting facts about ants perhaps, feel free to comment that down below. And if you enjoyed this video, learned something, and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. This video is made on behalf of the Garoka Natural Habitat, a place looking to preserve a slice of Papua New Guinean highland forest for education, research, enjoyment, and to teach people to cultivate honey at the same time. A huge thank you to Kelly Eni for letting me stay here and supporting this project. If you're looking for a great place to volunteer as a researcher, carpenter, teacher, beekeeper, fish pond specialist, mushroom grower, or any of other numerous other specialties, this is a great place to do it. So anyway, with that I'll wrap up. Stay tuned for more interesting tropical plants of Papua New Guinea. Until next time on Ambling with Sam.